Hello. Hold on a minute. I guess I didn't share this out, uh, which is not very smart. Um, where is my live stream? Here? Okay. Let me just share this out really quick. So we're going to talk about Diane Schuller. But there's a couple of things I want to say. Now, on HBO, there is shoot. There's a documentary, and I will not reference the name of that documentary any longer because the name of it is very offensive to the mother of the three little girls that was that were killed. And I'll explain why in just a second. This is like old times, isn't it, when I used to do this? Yeah, because I was finishing the book written by Jackie Hans, which is the, who is the mother of the three little girls killed in the crash. And there were more than three little girls killed in the crash, but she's the mother of those three little girls. And I'm going to explain it from her point of view tonight, which is different than a lot of other things. Okay, let me just um, make sure that I have this the way that I want it. Okay. All right, let me just put this on to Facebook. And then YouTube. So we're going to talk about it from that perspective. And her book is I'll See You Again. And I remember when that book came out, I saw it in the store. It was with my daughter. And then I was like, oh my gosh, that's written by that lady. So, yeah. Okay, let me see. Two. This go to my page. Okay, and then just let me post it on YouTube. And then we'll be good. Um, great post. Okay. I hate that it doesn't post our full thumbnail on the thing anymore. I don't know what the deal is with that. Okay, I'm done now with that. So I'm going to come back over here to the live stream. Make sure that I'm in top uh, live chat. All right. Hello there. Hi, everybody. So Janae wanted me to look at this case. I have looked at this case before. Hi, Kay Rocks. Hi, Sassy Darcy. Hi, Deborah Vancouver. Dan. Uh, flow on the go. Good to see you. Let's see. Julie W. Lady, did I see Lady Elaine? 
Lady Elaine, um, your stuff went out today, and I sent you um, the one thing that put in there. But every a lot of stuff went out today. A lot of stuff. Farm wife, hi. Um, Barb Olson, hello, Chris Ree, Christine Ferrara. Okay, Janae. So Janae asked me to look at this case again. I have covered this case a couple of times. The thing that I want to point out is that, and I'll pull it up, the campground, okay, Diane Schuler is the woman that took, that went on a camping trip with her husband. And they took their two children and they took Diane's brother's three girls. Now, in the book from the perspective of the mother of the three girls the brothers the brothers children i learned things that i that i didn't remember about and maybe maybe i did when i watched the documentary because i think back i think they touched on that diane's mother had left the family but i didn't know so much about the brothers family because they were not involved in the documentary at all they didn't want to be they were upset with it and they were especially upset at the title which is why i will not use that title anymore and a lot of people do it you know because the um mother of the little girls is most upset because those were her daughter's last words to her and she felt why is hbo using it in this documentary we want no part of so i'm not going now that i know that i'm not going to put those words in anything about this case so jackie is the mother of the two little girls hands and they have a foundation now her husband is warren warren is one of the older brothers of Diane Schuler. Diane Schuler being the baby of that family. And like I said, the mother left the family. She did come back into their life um, when Jackie was having another baby. She was invited to the baby shower. We'll talk about that too. But the father raised them. The father, Diane Schuller's father. And um, what happened was uh, Jackie came from an Italian Catholic family. They didn't do camping. She didn't really like being outdoors. She did. She was a runner, but she didn't like being out in the woods. Um, didn't even really. She told her kids a story about when she put her foot in the ocean and she felt something pinch it. And then she came out without two toenails. And her daughters were even like, Mom, that's weird. But she claim, claims that a crab ate her toenails. So this is why she doesn't like to go on camping trips. And in fact, they had gone on a camping trip, Hyatt's Bank, with her brother, I mean, with um, her husband's sister and brother-in-law. And they had done it last, the last year. So when it came around to this time this year, she really you know, didn't have any hesitation because she, they weren't the camping type. And um, her husband, who's the father of those three girls, said that, you know, he lived his life in such a way that the only vacations they had when he was a kid, they went camping. And he wanted to make it so that their vacations would not be camping. So neither of them were going to go on this camping trip, but they didn't go the year before either. And the campground was not far from where they lived. They lived out on Long Island. And um, so that's what was decided. And Diane, the sister, was going to use Jackie's minivan because it had more room for all the kids. So on the day of the trip, uh, Jackie, you know, had their bags packed. They were outside doing gymnastics. Diane Schuller was a little late getting to the house. She got to the house. Now, the, her brother, Warren, who's the father of those three kids, had said goodbye to the kids in the morning. But then, because Diane was late, 
he got home from work and said, oh, I get to see my kids off, you know, so they made sure everybody was buckled into the car right, and the thing that was a little bit of a holdup is Diane was going to have somebody going with her. Um, it, her father went last year, so it would be the grandfather of all the kids, but for some reason, he wasn't uh, going to go this year, and... Jackie felt, wow, that's a lot of kids, you know, for for Diane to manage all those kids. And she'd feel better with someone there if they had three adults and not just two. So the night before, um, Diane had said, I'm going to call around and see some friends or relatives if they can come. But it ended up nobody could go. However, she said, it's okay. It, it'll be fine. So she sent them off um, on this trip. And immediately after she did, you know, she went back in the house and she said, you know, I wish we could have been with them. And the husband's like, yeah, you know, but it, it'll be fine. And they called her when they got there and she was surprised at how quick it was. And they, she talked to them the next day and they talked about, you know, that their sisters were swimming out on the dock and their other sister wasn't, you know, able to go all the way out to the dock and they were having a good time and everything was great. And then um, she talked to them when they were on their way home and she never, she said, you know, she never gave it a thought on the way home, like on the way there, you know, there's, okay, they're on their way home. And Diana checked in, now she was in my neck of the woods. So where they were, let me get this. Ones. They were at the Hunter Lake Campgrounds. Okay, so. This is where they were. Okay, so let's see. People have campers and I believe um, they had a, a campsite there. They have the, you know, the lake there. Restroom, shower facilities, campsites. Yada yada, right? Okay, so that's where they were. And then she went to McDonald's and to the Sunoco gas station and there's surveillance footage of her going in that Sunoco gas station. Now, she had a little scuffle at the McDonald's because apparently she was going there at breakfast time and the kids she wanted to get them lunch and this this factors into some other things but at 9 56 a.m she was seen get this hold on <clears throat> She was seen at the McDonald's in Liberty, New York. And she was trying to order chicken selects during breakfast hours. And she was a little upset, like why couldn't she get those chicken selects? And she spoke with the employees there for some time. She was very engaging. She was able to convince them to make the chicken selects at 940 in the morning. There is a four minute surveillance video taken of Diane at a Snoko gas station in Liberty a few hours 
before she got on that Taconic Parkway going the wrong way. And she appeared to walk in there at the Sunoco perfectly fine. Said she was probably in there looking for some type of pain medication because she allegedly had something, an abscess with her tooth, okay, that was giving her pain. And she walked in and walked out of there. Let me see if I can... Let's see here. Okay. So this was her walking out of that Sunoco that day, right before she would be getting back. Oh, that's a very small picture. Hold on, let me make it bigger. Okay, so she was walking fine. She wasn't doing anything now. They had spoken with her, her sister-in-law. She wasn't slurring her words. Nothing, you know, out of the ordinary was going on. In fact, um... Here's a picture. Let's see. The camp of all the kids at the campground that weekend. Everybody having a good time. And, um,. So when they got up, they cleaned the boat out, they packed up the bags, and her husband and her, Diane's husband, and her had gone in two separate cars, okay? So the husband had the pickup truck, and she had the minivan. So he was behind her, he had the family dog in the pickup truck, and they drove together until they reached the parkway. Then Daniel continued the drive home in West Babylon so he could rest before his night shift at work. And Diane split off so she could get the kids breakfast and stop for gas. So Diane stopped in Liberty and visited McDonald's again. The kids spent time playing in the playground. There, That one used to have a playground there. And then after that, at 10.46 a.m., she is on that uh, Sunoco footage you just saw. So she went in, she tried to, she asked for over-the-counter pain medication. They didn't have that, and she left the store. At 11.37 a.m., Diane calls Jackie Hans, and that's the mom of the three girls, and she says they're running late, but that they will make it for one of uh, Jackie's girls had play practice, but they'll make it. Now, that was 1137. At about 12 noon, it's not even, you know, it's a, less than a half an hour after that call, a motorist on the throughway notices that a red van was weaving back and forth between the lanes, driving aggressively, and remembers seeing a woman gripping tightly onto the steering wheel with a really concentrated look on her face. Then there's the Harriman toll plaza. Okay. And when she went through that toll plaza, two people, Francis and Jean Bagley, noticed a red minivan driving so closely behind them that they couldn't even see the headlights. They heard the horn blaring behind them, and they watched as the van attempted to pass them on the shoulder but was unable to do so. She continued to blow the horn, and they pulled off into a rest area. 
as it, and the van went over also as the Bagleys pulled into the car lane they watched the minivan pull off into the truck lane and they saw the woman step out of the driver's side bend over hands on her knees as if she was going to vomit after coming off of the rest stop at 12 30 they noticed the red minivan was gone And then 12.55 on Diane's phone, a wrong number was dialed. And then Diane called Jackie right after that, sounding disheveled and disoriented. They talked for a bit and then hung up abruptly. Now, when that call came in, Jackie was like, oh my gosh, you know, what the heck is going on? And she told the uh, husband, she said, you know, hold on, I'm going to get exactly what she said here. Hang on, let me just pull this. Here is my thing on this. Hang on. Hold on, I want to get what, the, what exactly she said because it's important. Okay. Hold on a minute. I went too far. Right. Okay, so here's here's what happened. At twelve fifty-eight, I I said Jackie had spoken before. Okay, Emma won't be going to play rehearsal today. She tells her friend Melissa, Jackie did, the girls are going to get home late. Is everything okay? Everything's fine. At 12.58 p.m., it wasn't fine. The phone rang, and Jackie answers it. And Jackie's daughter, Emma, is on the phone and says, something is wrong with Aunt Diane. And Jackie says, what? What's wrong? Emma says, I don't know. She was crying and she sounded scared. And then she heard her other daughter, Allison, in the background was also crying. And she was wondering what was happening. But Diane took the phone from Emma and she told Jackie, they're just being silly. They're playing. Jackie says when Diane was saying this, her words were slurred, almost incoherent. And... She thought they were on the road heading home, pulled over somewhere. And she said, are you okay? Where are you? And Diane wouldn't answer. And she said, let me talk to Emma again. But Diane continued talking to her. Her sentences were muddled. And, um, she, and Jackie was looking for her cell phone because this came in on her home phone to call her husband Warren because he could take care of this. And... She got him on the cell phone and she said, I just spoke to your sister. She's slurring her words. She sounds drunk. And he said, impossible. She said, I know, but she sounded strange. Maybe she had a seizure. Maybe she had a stroke. And um, he called her right back. He said that Diane answered, but the brother knew something was wrong when he talked to his sister. Okay. She could not have a coherent conversation with him. So he said, stay right where you are. Do not move. Do you understand, Diane? Do not get back in the car. Do not move. He asked to speak to his daughter, and he told her, tell me what signs you see on the road. Read me the words. And 
at this time, Jackie said instead of being like really crazed, she felt an unexpected calm, but oh great, my husband knows how to handle this. He'll know what to do. Diane must be at a rest stop. Um, there's other adults around. Maybe there's a McDonald's and everything's going to be fine. And, and her husband was going to go get there. So Warren was listening. Emma was giving him road signs, spelling out words she didn't know. You know, she wasn't crying anymore. No one was crying anymore. And Warren thought that they had stopped at a rest area near the Tappan Zee Bridge. And he said, I'm on my way. He went rushing out the door. He called his father, Diane's father, right? His father. And he said, come with me because if Diane can't drive home, we're going to need you to you know, drive the van back home. All right. So they go flying off to go find her where they think she's in some kind of a rest stop, right? But that's not what happened. And then when he left the house, he tells his wife, Jackie, call 911. She calls 911 and uh, she gets to the Terrytown police, you know, and she's trying to tell them what's happening. And they're kind of like, well, you don't even know where she is, blah, 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 blah. And Warren gets there and he can't find them anywhere. So he's like, well, gosh, where are they? So he goes to the police station and the police are like, I don't know where she is, man. They don't have anything here. There's a diner down the road. Why don't you go down there? Maybe she stopped over there. So he goes to go to the diner. No, she's not there. He goes back to the police station. And this time, the police are outside waiting for him. So, and this is just like minutes after. And um, so then... He says, you know, we've got to go somewhere. I've got to take you to the hospital. Get in your car. And so Warren's driving to the hospital thinking, like, this is really bad. Where are my kids? When he gets in there, a trooper, because he runs into the, you know, emergency room looking, yelling for his, his uh, girls. Nobody's there. State trooper takes him into a side room and he tells Warren the news, okay? Okay. Warren ends up put, punching two holes in the wall and, um, you know, break, breaking down. And then the wife gets, you know, the news after you, they came back and, and gave her the news and that nobody survived except the little boy. The only survivor in Diane Schuler's car is this little boy right here. He's the only one that survived. Okay, and but she hit another car head on and she killed three people in that car. There's three, right? Hang on one second, let's make sure. Let's see, so here's what happened in the crash. At 1.33 p.m., Two different drivers made separate calls to 911, noticing that a red minivan was inching onto the northbound exit ramp of the Taconic State Parkway. State Parkway. In the next minute, four more 911 calls were placed, and she was going 75 to 80 miles per hour. She traveled almost two miles, 1.7 miles, until she headed. Uh, straight on, head on crash with a 2004 Chevrolet Trailblazer. The Trailblazer then crashed into a 2002 Chevrolet Tracker. By the time she crashed into the Trailblazer, Diane was traveling at a speed of about 85 miles per hour. Her minivan rolled over and it fell down an embankment, landed onto a grassy medium as it burst into flames. Now, the weird thing is, the girl, well, you will find out from the book, okay, the mother saw the girls and the girls looked fine by her own words 
fine. She couldn't understand how they were killed. And I'll explain that later because this is a whole different perspective on things, okay? Diane's son was the sole survivor. He sustained multiple broken bones and severe head trauma. And all three men in the trailblazer, 81-year-old Michael Bastardi, 49-year-old Guy Bastardi, and 74-year-old Daniel Longo were all killed. The two passengers in the Chevy Tracker suffered minor injuries. Witnesses and onlookers were flooding 911 with calls, and two bystanders ran to the minivan to get everyone out of the mangled burning car. There was a bottle of absolute vodka discovered at the scene. Broken bottle. Now, the toxicology report said Diane had a blood alcohol level of 0.19%, over double the legal limit in New York. On top of that, there were another six grams of alcohol in her stomach waiting to be absorbed. She had the equivalent of about 10 drinks with everything. And she had very high levels of THC. Now, when this came out, people were floored because Diane Schuler was like a PTA super mom. Nobody believed that this could be, you know, that she would have went drinking and driving. So there had to be, you know, another um, explanation for this. In fact, her husband, Daniel, vehemently denied any suspicions that his wife was an alcoholic or a drug addict and said, and I quote, I go to bed every night knowing she did not drink, she was not an alcoholic. My heart is rested every night, something medically had to have happened. Okay, now back to the sister-in-law because we're doing this from her perspective. The sister-in-law went through a series of different uh, reactions to this. Okay, first of all, she couldn't believe this, but second of all, you know, like she went running down the street and then when she found out, but then she said, well, they couldn't have, they wanted, this is, I don't understand this. She says they couldn't have an open casket. So she didn't even get to see her girls, but then she told them, if I, I need to see my girls. So they let her see the girls and she said the girls looked perfect. She didn't understand. So I, I don't understand then why they couldn't have the open casket if she saw them. But she said they were perfect. So how did they die? And then that drove her crazy. So she ended up going on like, how did they die? I have to see the autopsy. And the husband's like, no, you don't want to see the autopsy. So he, he didn't want her to see it. But one day when he left, she went and looked at it, called her friend over. She had, they had great friends. Okay. This is like their saving grace. They had these like wonderful friends. She had especially three really, really close friends that were like sisters to her that I mean, they never left her alone ever. Um, one would plan a day, like every Tuesday she came over, took her out, did cleaned up, did all kinds of things. E even camps like worked her vacations around that never left her one, one Tuesday. Um, the other ones would cancel their Halloween party that that year because it's just too much. And then, um, you know, always made sure that they had people around for the holidays, brought Christmas trees. They're, like, just were incredible. But she went through this, like... Um, Thing and, and I and I know I think I can understand what it is okay so she didn't want to have this hatred toward Diane and then she said once this hit and this became on social media 
she saw these blogs and, and podcasters and they were blaming her, them like, why would you let your kids go with an alcoholic? And um, why would you let, why wouldn't you go with your kids? You know, and she said the way with a lot of things, when, when there's something horrific that happens, it's human nature that people have to justify it and try to find reasons why it won't happen to them. So if they say, oh, I would never let my kids drive with anyone else. I would have been on the camping trip with my kids. I would then, in their minds, that can't happen to them because it's too scary to think that such a tragedy could happen to them and it can't happen to anyone. But this is how it is with everything in life. People go to justify to how that's not going to happen to them. And so in doing this, then a lot of people came out on social media and in blogs and said really terrible things. And it got so bad to the point that her husband disconnected the Wi-Fi, got rid of the, you know, the computers because it, it was so hor horrendous what was being said. And... Um, she didn't want to live at one point but she was catholic and first then she went the catholic guild something she must have done something for her you know all of her children to be taken away like that her husband and her were fighting you know because she was um she really liked diane but then now she couldn't help feeling like what the hell happened especially when you know the toxicology reports came back and what was going on and one night she said it you know your sister killed our your sister killed my kids and um she started like putting that hatred onto her husband where it shouldn't have been and he's not her, her sister but so then she felt she had to find something that in other words diane didn't do this because otherwise she felt like she wouldn't even be able to strange as it sounds, be with her husband anymore because she would have put that on, on to him. And so she began to start with the autopsy. And when the autopsy, she said, it doesn't sound, you know, this, what? And the, and the friend said, well, it's internal, you know, injuries and stuff like that. She went to the pediatrician, you know, and said, like, did the kids have some kind of a heart condition? Did they have some kind of, some kind of a defect that caused them all to die? Because I think at that point, it would have even been easier to hear that, yeah, all the kids had a, had a very strange heart condition and they were going to die and they died then, you know, it had nothing to do with. But even though like how irrational it was at the time, it sounded rational for her to do this. And um, she kept forgetting that her kids died too. So th that was really hard on her, on her husband and her friends because they had to keep newspapers around and they had to show her. And um, the husband was like, yeah, why, why is this happening? He took about two months off from work. They got a lot, they had a lot of donations coming in. Um, they started up a foundation in their kids' names, but they were have they were going to a, a counselor, but she kept telling this uh, counselor that she wanted to take her life, but then she had you know the fear that she wouldn't see them again and didn't want that. So then one night she said to her husband, you know, how about you kill me, and then I can go to heaven and see the kids, and uh, you know, and then he's like, no, I'm not doing that, and then she said, well. What about if I kill you? Um, I don't care about going to jail because I my life is a prison anyway. And this way you can be with the kids in heaven. And but have them alone, you know. So and th this stuff at this time sounded okay to her. And then it got to where she was telling her counselor, you know, I, I will take my own life, but I have to do it after this family fun day or this day or that day. And then the counselor was like, okay with that because he was saying, well, as long as she's got it, he told the husband, just let her have it as an out. I guess he knew like she wasn't going to do it, but she just wanted to hold it there like that she had the power to do that if she wanted to. Um, she said that 
when there was like sometimes they would go out and the friends would like arrange it for her to have a really good time and her husband and her went out for like one particularly good time where they went to this uh ball game but then when they came home it was coming home to the empty house and everything it was so horrendous that she would spend the next few days in bed and her husband and her would be fighting and then she'd say is this worth it it's not worth it why go out and and have a good time and then come home to this you know and it happened the same thing when they went on vacation they went on vacations with friends to like uh, the keys and they had a great time and she's like you know you can't be depressed on the beach and wonderful 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 and then as soon as it was like time to go home and uh go back to the house that it was it was horrible it was horrendous when they got home and she said you know why do we do this to ourselves this is crazy um this is it's not a, not a good thing and she was slowly navigating through the different holidays when it came to this happened in july so when it came to september and it was her daughter's birthday she was the kind of person that threw these huge parties she rented these well actually they bought this big uh, event tent for twenty five hundred dollars when oh, their first daughter was like a year old because she threw these huge huge parties she was known for these huge parties that she threw and all the stuff she would make in fact she even had like some kind of a catering business with it and uh, her girls were helping and she said but she never made money on the catering of the events because she always went over the top and uh, to make things look right and ended up losing money on the events but you know enjoyed ha doing them for people that she knew so she had this party for the kids like with the the whole tent and everything and had all these kids in the house and kids playing on the the swing set and all of that and uh, you know it was um it was uh very good but then when it was over again she thinks that like she even when it was happening like well this is happening um but my kids aren't here or when she took place in things even for this foundation that they had and they were doing good things for people then she was thinking okay this great stuff is happening but it's happening because my kids are dead and so there's always these voices going through her head and um she didn't want to get a, a different car at first you know the, the van was totaled in the in the crash but when you know she remembered something with her husband where she had told the girls that she was talking about cars and she said something about a convertible and her kids had said oh mama you would look good with your hair blowing in the breeze and she was jokingly said to her husband you know if i got another car i would get a convertible but it would have to have a hard top and it would have to have a back seat and this and that and didn't think much of it anyway her husband went out and um had someone he knew uh, you know got picked up i don't think it was new it was used a volvo convertible and she was out with a girlfriend and he had it there and she was like happy and laughing for a little bit and they took the car around she got her friends and then immediately thought came to her head that was like oh there she is she traded in her kids for a convertible because if she was laughing or she was happy then she saw it as people were saying this about it so about her and she literally um would spend day days in bed she didn't have a job and uh so she could should spend days in bed and her husband was you know taking care of the family and plus she said they had had a lot of donations let she her words were money was pouring in after the kids died so they spent the kids college funds uh for the funeral and let's see what else happened there so it was a series of events like that so every time she would either do something with the foundation it would end with her being miserable coming home and just being in bed for two days and there was one certain event and I think it was her husband told her you shouldn't do that again or somebody told her don't do that again because 
Every time you do it, you come home miserable. Even though she was happy when she was there, she couldn't get past that, you know, this wouldn't be happening um, if, it wa if it wasn't uh, for the kids dying. And uh, her mother, they were off on a vacation. And I guess the kids had a swing set that they had since the oldest one was like a year old. And when they went on a vacation somewhere, the, her mother called her. She was dog sitting and said, uh, I just want you to be prepared that Warren, the husband, is having someone take down the kid's swing set. So she first started to go bonkers about that. Why would you do that? Um, you know, that our kids played on that swing set. Why would you do that? And his thing was that, oh, well, it was uh, a need of repair. Someone could get hurt on it. And she just went with that but meanwhile he had somebody build her like this rock garden there in these fountains where it was but she still missed seeing that and let's see um they had an older wheaton terrier he got a uh, havanese brought that home but she didn't even want any part of that really she said um, she couldn't see getting up or doing anything so he said well, i'll take care of you know the dog um literally i mean in in the book their fights were very real uh you know where she's um at one point her husband uh took off they had a um rule early on that if they would get upset or you know storm out during a fight that they would not get into a vehicle because you know something had happened so at one point, um, when she was saying, you know, I think it was the, the one where she said, your sister killed our kids. And uh, he said, I'm not my sister, uh, you know, this and that. He took off down the street and, and she was running after him. And, um, and then he said, I'm going to throw myself in front of a train. And she was trying to go after him, but he got too far ahead of her and she went upstairs and she was laying in bed and she just said, that's it, I drove him away. He's gonna go, uh, you know, I, I, he's never said anything like this and this is bizarre, but he came back. And then another time when she was texting, it was when this HBO thing was coming out with Diane's husband, who they hadn't spoken to, okay, they've spoken to the sister-in-law, Jay, but that's one of the people when she was trying to figure out how the kids died. And what I mean by how the kids died, she seemed to want to find any other way or reason for this other than Diane was the cause of this, right, because of how it made her feel. So, um, she went to the pediatrician. She asked if they had any kind of a condition that would have caused them to die like that. And the pediatrician said, no, they did not. This, this was a result of this crash. And um, she just, it was, it was ridiculous. She couldn't reconcile this. And then one day she went to the cemetery and this is after she had a baby so she had had her tubes tied after the third child and people were saying well you should have another baby and she's like you know, I don't want another baby I, I don't um, but then she ended up going to a fertility doctor and they told her you know it was gonna be like twenty five thousand dollars and she was like oh no and then somebody she knew knew this Manhattan fertility specialist and they told her to come in and the doctor said you know why are you here you want to get pregnant she said I don't want to get pregnant I just want to freeze embryos because they said you could freeze embryos so she said well we have to tell us what it is and they said don't worry about it just book your appointment so it the doctor did this for them free of charge and 
She went through three rounds freezing embryos and still didn't implant them yet. And um, she said, you know, the whole protocol and everything was almost um, good for her because it gave her structure something to do and it, and it didn't bother her that she had to go through like different appointments or whatever it was because it was something to do. And then she eventually said, let's do it and um, they wanted to implant you know multiple embryos into her she did not want to have multiples so she only wanted one implanted the doctor said that's you know it's not what we do so he ended up plant implanting two embryos and one took and was a girl Casey and then when the baby was born he, she had incredible like postpartum but it was like uh, this guilt that she had so to feel happy with the baby it meant she was forgetting her other kids um, if she would accidentally call the baby one of the girls names you know so all of these like conflicting emotions were on her and in the first like six weeks she was extremely depressed we were trying to figure out what was going on but she you know, would look at the baby and, or if somebody would say, oh, she's such a good baby, she would say, oh, what did they forget? Katie, Katie was a good baby too. You know, this would go through her mind, these, these thoughts. And then she finally, you know, went to get help. She got some medication and she started to say, you know, she could love this baby and she did love this baby it didn't mean that she didn't love her others and she then made it that she would tell this baby about her sisters they would be included and then she started to talk to this baby about the sisters and their her name is has all of the initials of their names incorporated in it so she started to feel better with that and you know this baby gave her um a reason to live which is good because like she said all of these like material things like this car and and everything um were nothing compared to like your family and all of that i think it would be hard for someone to uh if they were reading this book and and they had lost all, all of their children or their only child to read this and you know not have the opportunity to have another child because it kind of a it's a little bit that uh, like if you don't have that uh like i like i have a friend um she lost her only son and and she she she's, she's not going to have another uh, child that that's it um and i'm thinking of somebody from that perspective was to read this book you know it's kind of like um i don't know I, I think it would be ultra depressing just by some of the things that were said and there's nothing wrong with her feelings and it's the way she feels but i'm just saying for someone that would be reading this had they lost their children and were not able to have another child i i think it would be um i don't know i think it would leave you really depressed because in her case it didn't sound like things got better until she had another baby and then even when she had another baby things were not better right away but um once she figured she could tell them about the baby like the the, the christmas that the baby was born and they they would go to the cemetery to see the other three kids to visit with them and they couldn't do it one day you know the, and she said how can we not go to our girls and then her husband said our girls are here with us we don't have to go to the cemetery to be with them they're not in the cemetery okay they're with us and um she said like for the first time her husband made sense and she went with the baby you know to the relative's house and you know she put the baby in the tree and, and she had a good time um but every time she went to anything 
even when she had a good time prior to having the baby, she would come home and be in bed for days and like just be flat out because when she got home to that empty house and she gave away her KitchenAid mixer and she gave away her Cuisinart, she didn't want to cook anymore except for the dog, but she didn't want to do any of that stuff she did. And she loved having those parties and she was having these huge parties and she was even going to like continue like, oh, it's this one's communion and it, and I mean big, big parties because it was somebody's, I think it was their communion and they had a huge party. Uh, for the communion and they rented out like a banquet hall which you know is a little different but they did and then he had his first dance with her he made uh, the husband made a speech and then he um he played uh Buble's, uh which one did he do i forget what the name of the song was um it's about people that had it all and then they like lost it all. They were the ones that were the lucky ones. Um, and, she, you know, so she said that's kind of how it how it was. And let's see. Then, again, she had like, they had tremendous friends that like never left them alone. She said, you know, like a lot of times with grief, people want to get the heck away from you because you're a reminder of what can happen. You and people feel like sometimes that kind of stuff is contagious. They don't want it. They don't want to be around it. They don't want to be reminded of what could happen. Um, and so they pull away. But their friends were like in it for the long haul. And they had neighbors that were like that. And so at that point after the baby was born... She went to the cemetery and they had everybody in the same plot. Okay, so Diane was there and Diane's daughter, who also was killed. Uh, she went to Diane's gravestone for the first time and then told her that she forgived her. She said she never mentioned it to her husband because forgiveness, you know, it doesn't have to be a big thing. But she felt, um, you know, something lift then. And... Uh, she said other people started to notice something, you know, in her. So she thinks that uh, definitely did. And what was the other thing? Now that little girl is uh, going to be 12 years old yet. No, let me think. Yeah, 12 years old. On October 11th. Um... Let me see. And again, they didn't, they don't speak to a Daniel. And one of the things she said when the HBO thing was coming out was how could you uh, do this about our daughter's last words or something? And she wrote him this long thing. And then he said, go get yourself help. Or see, he answered or something like that. So she freaked out when he said that and she called him up and they started screaming at each other and everything and that was um really bad but uh that's how that uh went there and you know i mean she tried also to figure out with I believe it was that sister-in-law that was working with the husband. How could this have happened to Diane? Could somebody at McDonald's have spiked uh, her drink or something with something because she made such an issue of getting those chicken selects, okay? Then they said, could she have had a stroke? Um, there was uh, something that... They say at that McDonald's there was some kind of a drug bust and something about a cop from there got killed or something. So they made some kind of conspiracy. Could it have been that? Um, and the sister-in-law said there was a firefighter and he was killed in the fire and it looked like he had a high blood alcohol level, but it was the heat that caused um, 
that to happen so then they were saying could that have happened but why was the vodka bottle there and did she have a toothache and was she trying to do this for the tooth so it just went back and forth that she was trying to find a reason that this happened I guess so that she wouldn't be hating and not being able to forgive Diane and um it ended up to that when she was talking about that she said something else what did she say about um what was I gonna say about her having the tooth um trying to think of what the heck she, about the tooth there was something I was going to say about the tooth um why she would have died was it a stroke was it oh yes about the mother that left she was saying like well how did that affect Diane how did that affect uh her husband her own husband she's saying like well he had his mother walk out on him and then he had his three girls die and my that's one of the reasons she said I didn't leave him because Maybe I should have even walked away at the at the points, you know, some points we had. But I didn't want to do that because every woman had been taken from him, you know. And um, he ended up having his mother at the baby shower for the uh, new baby. So, you know, I, I don't know. I mean, it's just, uh, so she was, but she was even saying, you know, how was Diane affected by that? Was you, There was all kinds of things she was trying to do to come to terms with that. Um, but let me see there's something over here I don't know to see Okay, now the HBO documentary came out two years after, again, and it was not, um, oh yeah, the other thing is, yes, so with, um, why is this making me do this again? Hold on one second, I when this does this. So what was I going to say? I was going to tell you something about... What the heck was I going to tell you? Um, what the heck was I going to tell you? Something. Um... Heck was it? That's scary. I am trying to remember what I was going to tell you. All right, let me just get my password to something here. There was something. I can't think of what the freak it was. I'm going to tell you about, oh yeah, HBO, that's what it was. So she said that HBO then sent them a $30,000 check to their foundation. And she was like jumping up and down thinking, oh, what we can do with this money, you know, the foundation. And that's when she found out what HBO named the documentary. And she's like, there's no way, there is no way that we are accepting this money absolutely not so they sent it back and they told HBO please take the money and donate to you know these charity organizations and they said that HBO to their knowledge never made that donation okay and let's see um 
they gonna say? Trying to get my password here, sorry. Very weird. Okay, here it is. I'm sorry. Got it. Uh, well, maybe because. Hold on a minute. What's going on with this? Okay, maybe it's not that one. Okay, I'm not going to worry about this anymore. I can't deal with that. I'll find it later. So. So here's another... surveillance photo of her in that gas station. <clears throat> oh my goodness, stop. Oh, sorry, my, my computer's going to be funky crazy. I can't do anything except talk to you right now, so... I can't even see you guys or anything. But, yeah, I mean, it's I'll See You Again. It's written by Jackie Hans. If you want to see the, you know, understand the tragedy from a different perspective than you see in... The, um, hang on a minute, what is going on here? Be quiet. In the documentary on HBO, I think it's 
a good read. Oh my goodness. Okay. So let's see. Um, So the people that were killed in the SUV, the Bastardi family, the lawyer for Michael Bastardi and his son Guy, because they had a you know a, a lawsuit. They were saying a long list of ridiculous excuses why Diane Schuller could not have been drunk was about that chicken selects, and it became known as the chicken selects defense. Let me read about, I want to read about that, um, Okay, hang on. So there were six, six lawsuits resulting from that crash. Okay, the the original crash happened July twenty sixth of two thousand and nine. Diane Schuler was thirty six years old, and she had. Her three nieces, between the ages of five and eight, in the vehicle. And she had her two-year-old daughter who was killed and her five-year-old son, the only survivor. Now, in 2009, Roseanne Guzzo, the sister of Guy Bastardi, who was killed in the crash, and the daughter of Michael Bastardi Sr., filed a wrongful death suit against the Schuller estate and, get this one, against Warren Hans, the father of those three children that were killed because he was the owner of the van that Diane was driving. And that claimed that Schuller negligently operated the vehicle in an intoxicated condition and caused the deaths of her brother and father. And then a lawsuit by Daniel Schuller, the husband of Diane Schuller, against the New York State, alleging that the accident was caused by negligent roadway design, maintenance, and improper signage, resulting in the death of his two year old daughter and injuries to his surviving son. And then a second lawsuit by Daniel against his brother-in-law, Warren, claiming that Warren was responsible as the owner of the minivan. A suit by Jackie, the mother of Katie, Allison, and Emma, alleged that due to Diane's negligence and intoxicated operation of the minivan, her daughters suffered pre-impact fear and terror, fear of impending death, and extreme horror and mental anguish. That lawsuit was commenced in Suffolk County Supreme Court. And then Daniel Longo's brother, Joseph, Daniel was killed in the crash too in the SUV, sued both the Schuller estate and Warren Hentz for the wrongful death of his brother. Both lawsuits by Daniel Schuler have a substantial likelihood of being dismissed, as this was said at the time that they were filed, due to the incontrovertible fact that Diane Schuler's operation of the minivan in the wrong direction in an intoxicated condition with a blood alcohol concentration more than double the legal limit was the proximate cause in causing the accident. 
It's also highly unlikely that any juror in Westchester or Suffolk County would determine that there was anything Guy Bastardi could have done to avoid the car accident with a vehicle coming in at him uh, between 65 and 70 miles per hour with an intoxicated driver behind the wheel. As for Warren Hans, he was sued in several of the cases due to his status as the owner of the minivan that his sister Diane was driving. However, it does not appear that there's any evidence that he knew that his sister was driving his minivan in an intoxicated condition, except for a brief phone call shortly before the fatal crash when Diane called him by the Tappan Zee Bridge within minutes of the accident. At that time, it was apparently too late to stop her, although it is believed he tried. Okay, uh, let's see here. Okay. Start to go to my life over here. Hang on one second. I'm trying to get back to the live chat. Very sorry. Oh, too many tabs. Things open. Okay. Now I lost my live chat. Hang on. YouTube Studio. Come on. Content. Live. Okay. Let me get over in here now, please. All right, so there we go. Let me get over here. Just have to do something. Okay, did I see? Oh, no, 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 no. Hi, Moonchild Pink. Oh, my gosh. I just dropped my keyboard. Hold on a minute. Having a, having a little difficulties. Having a few difficulties. Okay. Let me see what you're saying. Never lend out your car. Dang, that case has been going on that long. Oh, well, no, that that's settled. I mean, it, that's when it happened. Hi, Mary Ann. Okay, let me go back now. Well, they, no, hi, they never thought she was an alcoholic. Never. Okay? She never... Um, he never saw her intoxicated or anything like that, and that's from the mother of the girls. Okay, so let me see this now. Okay. All right, so back to this now. No criminal charges in the Taconic crash that was then, let's see.
Okay, husband defends. So there's quite a bit. Crash lawyers. Okay. So I don't know what the that was her her theory. That's not what I want. I want. That's what I want. Okay, so they actually made a Law and Order episode that was, when was this, that they made this Law and Order episode? In November of 2009, that was taken from that case. That was real quick to come up with something right um, Hang on one second, because it's locking up again. Better, I must have to get rid of. Okay, here we go. Although I'm trying to close some windows here. The mystery of the mystery phone. What was going on with the missing phone? As Warren Hans desperately tried Sunday to call back his sister, her cell phone lay useless on the side of the New York State Thruway. The phone was discovered Sunday by a motorist from New Jersey who turned it in to the Palisades Parkway Police. Oh, so they didn't even find her phone at first. Emma was eight, Allison was seven, Kate was five, 
Erin, too, that was Diane's, and she was only 36 years old. She appears older. Um, Let me see if there was anything that but yeah, I mean, so how is that explained? you know, did she just suddenly I mean they didn't I mean, the sister in law would have no reason uh to lie in in the book I mean Wasn't that she was covering up for the husband or anything else? Like what what was up with that the THC and the alcohol in Diane Schuller, right? So now they were saying Ambisol. The explanations keep coming. A lawyer for the man whose drunk wife drove the wrong way on the Taconic Parkway and caused a crash that killed eight people continues to theorize about why Diane Schuller's blood alcohol level was so high and his latest explanation borders on the absurd. Lawyer Dominic Barbara now says Ambisol, an over-the-counter medication used to ease minor tooth and gum pain, is to blame for the crash. She took Ambisol for a toothache. That's what caused it. Arguing that the drug causes false positives on alcohol tests. Look it up on the internet. Diane Schuller's autopsy revealed she had 6 grams of undigested alcohol in her stomach and her blood alcohol level was 0.19, the equivalent of 10 shots of vodka. She used marijuana as soon as 15 minutes before the crash that killed her daughter. Oh, that's another thing. She said that her daughters knew all about drunk driving. When the parents used to have date night, they had this driver that would take them if they were going to drink. The kids knew about that. She said, you know, her daughter was like a perfect big sister. If she would have ever seen her aunt drinking, she would have said something. Um... Spokesperson for Ambisol, Wyeth, confirmed the drug contains small amounts of benzyl alcohol, but says it dissolves immediately after application. Daniel Schuller, Daniel Schuller has adamantly maintained his wife had no drinking or drug problem and that some strange medical mystery was to blame for the crash. The autopsy indicated no medical mystery that could have been responsible. It showed Schuller had consumed the equivalent of 10 shots of vodka and had high levels of THC. Let's see here. Hmm. 
Husband said right before they left, he gave her a cup of coffee that they drank. More than one account. Yeah, there was a pushing on the Taconic, yes. Um, so a lot of people are thinking that, you know, she hid this. Husband said he's never seen her drunk. Okay, let's see. I've never seen her drunk since the day I met her, Daniel Schuller said, referring to his wife, Diane. I'm not angry at her. I'd marry her again tomorrow. And the broken vodka bottle was found in the van. Here. It's weird. Okay, if the, if everybody says you know, they've never seen her drunk. I mean, when I read the sister-in-law's book, I'm wondering, let me see something where, do, 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 do. hold on one second. It was a 1.75 liter of absolute vodka bottle that was in the, the van. And Diane Schuller was a Long Island Cable Company executive. I just see one thing here about the... Uh,
Okay, so here's the thing. The toxicology report is going to be released. It's not good. That's what her husband, that's what Warren told his wife, Jackie. The police had been calling it an accident, a mystery, and saying that alcohol did not seem to be involved, that Diane had driven down the exit ramp to the Taconic Parkway. It was poorly marked, isolated, and there were reports of local residents being worried about people getting confused. But once on the highway with cars, Diane could have pulled over onto one of the grassy areas. Drivers who passed her honked their horns. They tried to gesture. Some said she was staring straight ahead, holding the steering wheel in the 10-2 position and seemed calm. Others say she was straddling the lane and seemed erratic. But why did she keep driving? The toxicology says Diane was drunk. Diane's blood alcohol level had been 0.19%, twice the legal limit. And the mother of the girls, the first response was, no, it's got to be a mistake. To which Diane's brother says, no, it's an official report. It's not a mistake. And the mother of the girls says, no, it's got to be some mistake. It's, it's a mistake. Um, Diane wouldn't be drunk with five kids in the car. Um. And the sister-in-law said Diane treated her own da her daughters like her own children. Called them before the first day of school. Sent loving cards for Valentine's Day. Stopped by just to see him. Say hello. They were not happy with uh, Danny getting Dominic Barbara as who they say a loudmouth lawyer. And that's what started the rift between the families. Dominic Barbara's name is linked with Joey Buttafuku. 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 You know, Amy Fisher. It's not who you would turn to for high moral integrity. And I'm just trying to see where they... Danny said he and Diane had a couple of cups of coffee together at the campground the morning of the crash. Everything was fine. A few hours later, you know, what happened? Police investigation found Diane made two other stops. First, early in the trip, she went to McDonald's to buy everyone breakfast. Everyone remembered her because Brian, her five-year-old son, had wanted chicken selects. And the guy at the counter insisted they don't serve them that early. Wanting to make sure that the children all got what they wanted, Diane asked to talk to a manager. She had been completely rational and determined in the conversation. Later, she stopped at a gas station and went into the convenience store. She left the kids in the car, and the surveillance uh, video showed she walked through the aisles. Then she left without buying anything. The evidence didn't add up. So. <clears throat> 
So her sister-in-law wanted subconsciously to hope to absolve Diane of any blame. And so the theory that the lawyer for Danny had was theory one was Diane had a tooth abscess. Diane hated dentists and she briefly talked to the clerk at the convenience store, walked out when they didn't have the pain medication she wanted, and they're linking the theory of a throbbing tooth that she may have begun drinking to ease the pain. But then Jackie said she couldn't see her chugging vodka in front of the kids. And she just couldn't see it. When it came down to, to it, she didn't believe Diane had been drunk. She heard her slur her words on the phone, but she thought more likely a stroke or a seizure. And when she spoke to her 40 minutes earlier, she had been fine. So how does she go from fine to deadly drunk in 40 minutes? She couldn't even think of it. The second uh, thing was that someone in McDonald's had drugged her, like I said. And um, that didn't you know, much ado about nothing on that. And it's just, you know, no one can really... The facts are what the facts are. And it's just uh, why, why she would do that when she, I don't know. What do, what do you guys think? I mean, it's, it's a crazy case as much as I study it and see it it's just it's a crazy crazy case of what how she would arrive at that state hi pilot pete oh my gosh i haven't seen you in so long i wonder if the husband and sister-in-law ever accepted she was intoxicated i told you she just forgave her and um I don't know if she ever came to that. I don't know. Don't buy the McDonald's. But attempt that someone drugged her there. She seriously grasping at straws. Yeah, hi Meredith Page. Um, oh, thank you for whoever sent the super chat. Thank you. And thank you for the new member. Let's see who the new member is. Who's our new member? Hello, two scooter. Oh, Billy Boy Blue. Thank you for the super chat. And who's our new member? Hi, John Wasaki. Maybe no notice. Oh, Billy, yeah. I got Billy on that, but I don't know who the new member is. Uh, did she fill up her McDonald's cup with the vodka, possibly, when the kids weren't looking? She could have possibly sip it to try to ease the possible extreme tooth pain. Yeah, maybe. Don't know. Hi, Abba. Yeah, it's very sad, and
Okay, so let's see here. Her sister-in-law was the most responsible person she knew, said Jackie Hans. She spoke out for the first time about the tragedy that ripped her family apart ahead of the documentary seeking to clear her sister-in-law's name. 40-year-old Jackie describes the unbearable silence of her once lively home in Floral Park, her battle to save her marriage, why she lost her faith, and how she desperately is trying to be excited about her new baby that is due in the fall. This is, this is back then, okay? Uh, let's see. Toxicology report after the crash revealed that Mrs. Schuller had drunk the equivalent of 10 shots of vodka and was high on cannabis before she barreled in the wrong direction down the Taconic Parkway and speeds of up to 70 miles per hour for more almost two miles. People always ask how I feel about Diane. You can't imagine how complex that question is. How does a person go from being like a sister to me, adored by my girls and cherished by my husband, to being the one who ruined our lives? How could this person I trusted completely have done something so unthinkable that I couldn't and still can't wrap my head around it? couple battling to stay together said Warren and I have struggled with our grief and the differences in how we grieve from the first day he copes by staying busy and trying not to think about it I'm the opposite I need to talk we are different people but we're both broken I need someone to help me take the pain away but how can Warren do that for me when he's in the same place struggling with his own pain when I look to him for strength all I see is heartache In the month after the girls died, the couple's friends stayed at their home 24 hours a day, sometimes sleeping outside of Jackie's bedroom door to stop her from wandering outside in a daze in the middle of the night. She used to go to church every week, but stopped after the crash when priests told her the girls had been taken by God to be together. She said, but after this tragedy, I stopped going. How could I believe that God had been listening to my prayers? Her early morning running group is sometimes the only thing that gets her up. On the first anniversary of the girl's death, Jackie said she realized she had to start living her life again. She and her husband go out for dinner with friends each weekend, as they used to do when the girls were alive, but she worries that everyone's staring at her and thinking she's forgotten her daughters. She said, they can't imagine how I feel a couple of hours later when we get back home and there's no babysitter to pay. They don't see me the days I'm in pajamas, unable to move. The couple also started a charity, the Hans Family Foundation, as a way of coping with their grief. They hold fundraising events, the proceeds of which go towards projects to help the girls build their self-esteem. To help girls. Uh, let's see. Yeah, so that's not as far as it goes there with... Just can't think of uh, how, you know, it happened. And that's, that was two years after. I'm trying to get back to the chat.
What are you talking about? I'm trying to see what uh, Meredith is talking about, multiple fractures and stuff. this happened. Let's see. This is a case where my guy just finished doing five years in jail because he was drunk and drove into oncoming traffic and killed a minivan full of passengers. Five people he killed. Where, where your guy the guy, not my guy. Oh, okay. White Angel, that's horrible. I was hit head on by a drunk driver in 2014. Were you really, Meredith? Oh, that's terrible. Broke everything from the waist down. Wow. So sorry. That's horrible. Oh, yeah, they have really great friends. Unbelievable friends. You're welcome, Barb. So that is that. Anybody have any questions? Questions, questions. Do you have questions? Now, if you go to, uh, let me see. Oh my goodness, I'm just trying to show you a picture. Okay, so let's see. Someone, the father, Warren, said in 2016, when you lose an 8-year-old, a 7-year-old, and a 5-year-old, you have not only affected your family, but an entire community. The Hans Family Foundation is holding a fundraiser, so that's what he was talking about. And he said, losing their children could have ended Warren and Jackie's marriage and plunged them into a dark depression. What the human body is capable of, no one knows until you're faced with the worst of the worst of the worst. You get up and you walk and you have no other choice. Oh, that was another thing she said. She said people would come up to her and say, oh my gosh. Oh, that was the thing she said. If she got up and she put makeup on and she dressed nice and she put jewelry on and she went into a store which was so hard for her to do because to go to the grocery store just reminded her of her, of her family and she didn't want to run into certain people and but if she did she said they told her wow you look good as if it was almost a dig and then she would go 
home like you know like how could you look good when you lost your kids like how, how could you even care about putting on makeup or or brushing your hair or even going on with life this is what she felt so she would come home and collapse on the couch and crying 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 that she said and if i go out and i look haggard that is that what i'm supposed to look like haggard is that you know you don't know what i'm doing when i'm home okay so she she st kept struggling with this and uh you know it's that kind of like how you don't have to be accountable to anybody in your grief but certain things people say make you feel like you're doing something wrong even when they haven't faced it and the other thing people would say is oh you're so strong if that was me i couldn't do it like she said like if there's a choice okay and she's like people say that because like they want to say to god oh i'm weak don't you put this on my lap because i'm not strong like that i can't handle that and if i say i can't handle it then that won't happen to me so it was like one of those things so she was saying you think like you what do you think i'm strong i'm collapsing in a heap i can't get out of my bed for days you know it's and it's something that people do say to a lot of people and it's really there is no choice um, so her husband was saying a few years ago, the, um, Hanses were blessed with another daughter, Casey, when you absolutely have everything taken away from you, I mean, everything, when someone hands you something, it is everything. This is what she is to us today. Giving back is giving the couple a new purpose. You go from a decision to survive to a plan and structure for success. And once you get to success, you decide that service is the way to make that happen. and get something better. Okay, and this is the their this is their Instagram for their foundation. Come on, get over there. Oh my goodness. Oh, and she had friends that made her and bought her jewelry with the kids' initials E, A, K. And this big cross that she had um, that her husband got her. But People were always having jewelry made with her kids' initials, and these were her friends and stuff that kept sending things, and she said, and perfect strangers sent her things and um, donations, and what is with this? Okay, 
so that's not working. Hold on. I don't know what is up with that. Now that's completely stopped there. That's great. goodness. Okay. Hmm. Okay, so. Here we go. Finally. All right. Delayed reaction. So the Hans Family Foundation, nonprofit organization in honor of Emma, Allison, and Katie. We proudly present our self-esteem rising programs worldwide. Gotta go get it again. Uh, I wanted to show you the Instagram. This is, yeah, this is them. That's the, you know, that, uh, the baby. So this was 2009. So there are kids today, 2009. Oh my gosh, Luke was a few months old. So they would be 19. five-year-old would be 19. And the seven-year-old would be like 21 and 23. That's crazy.
Anyway. Oh, and the family fun day was something. I think the family fun day was something in their town or something. But, uh, anyway, um, let's see. You wonder, yeah, I don't know how he's doing. He would be, yeah, he would be 19 too. I wonder, let's see if we can see anything. Uh, let's see. Let me close some of these windows so I can... I don't even know where my live went anymore. Uh-oh. It says excellent. Okay, it says, hold on. My whole thing is locked up. Hi, Michael. How are you? My whole thing is locked up. I think I should just... Mm. Come on, shut down this. Sorry guys, I'm trying to shut some stuff down. Nothing wants to shut down. I can't see my live at all. Shut that. Come on, shut. Thank you. Shut. Come on. Be good, be good. Oh my goodness, I'm sorry. So. I will see in one second. Sorry guys, but this just wants to be a little jerk. A little jerk is what it wants to be. Close all tabs to the right. Stop being a little jerk. Being a 
little jerk. A little jerk. Oh my gosh, all I did is ask it to shut all the tabs to the right. You think it would be so happy. Quick, she said we could shut all the tabs to the right. Okay, what is it telling me here? Close the program if you don't want to respond. Close the dang program. Okay, now I'll open it up again, guys. I'll try to open it up again. Close that dang thing. Okay. All right, I'm not going to restore anything. I'm just going to turn on YouTube, go to my live. YouTube Studio, and then I'm going to go to Content, and I'm going to go to Live, and I'm going to go here. Okay, sorry, I am lost it a little bit. You know that. Can't help it. Now let me find out about Diane Schiller's son. Okay, let's see where he is. It says the Taconic Parkway is the most dangerous highway in New York State. It's not a highway that I go on. I don't even know if I've been on it ever, the Taconic. I don't know why. I don't know where. Why anybody's on that.
so let's see Mike Bastardi's wife, Jean, says that Mike's father and brother, Guy, were in the trailblazer that Diane hit along with their friend, Daniel Longo. Danny didn't even acknowledge my loss, says Mike. Jean's the one with no grays in her life, it's all black and white. Not even a second have I felt sorry for Danny. This becomes a man you can't hate enough, she said. So, let's see. The Bastardis grew up in auto parts. Mike's father started a business in the Bronx. After high school, Mike went to work full-time for his father with whom Jeannie had also worked. The Bastardi's business thrived. Mike left the Bronx, was tired of it, and they moved upstate to four acres in Warwick, New York, country-like place that Danny, a hunter and fisherman, would like. Danny refuses to go to Manhattan, doesn't like overcrowded Long Island. Let's see. On that July 26, Mike Jr. was returning from Wildwood. He went down for a few days with the immediate family. Oh, let me see. Looks like Guy's car, then the brother-in-law, Joe. And I'm kind of it's just kind of all over the place. To Larry King, Larry King, wow. That's I, I can't find much about the boy where he is now. Let me just see if I can do that. <laughs> Ten years later. I don't know. I can't say anything about him. Nope. I don't see anything about him. Back to here.
Carolyn, what jersey is that? It's a Nike. No, it's it's like a it's a performance shirt. It's not you know it's uh it's not it's not somebody's jersey. It's just a Nike sport shirt. One of those wicking ones, you know? I've looked everywhere in my account and cannot find the block list. Oh, you no problem. Hi. What's rescheduled? Concert? Oh, really? Huh. Yeah, I'm always having a heck of a night on my computer. All right, so some people can't handle terrible tragedy. All right, let's just take a look at what else is going on in the other headlines, right? Let's take a look because there were some other things going on. on the, So Alex Murdaugh seeks to change his not guilty plea for his financial fraud charges to guilty. All right. That looks like a new picture. So attorneys for Alex Murdaugh have filed a request to change his plea on federal financial fraud charges from not guilty to guilty. Court is scheduled this hearing for September 21st in Charleston, South Carolina. Hey, Elle, you and, you and uh, Janae can go down there and cover that September 21st. Murdaugh was indicted on 22 counts in May. The charges include wire fraud, bank fraud, conspiracy to commit fraud, money laundering. The plot entailed conspiring with a local banker and an attorney to steal more than $8.7 million. It's not clear if his attorneys are trying to work out a deal with prosecutors for a guilty plea because he faces up to 480 years in prison and nearly $13 million in fines. Murda also faces more than 100 financial fraud charges in state and local courts and is the defendant in several civil lawsuits. So let me just put that in here. I'm going to go and see what else. I think they're trying to work out a deal so they don't have to go back and let's see. Sorry, just laughing at something here. So they're saying now there's some people missing in Colorado. Over there. 
On Tuesday, Colorado officials say they suspended the search for a Florida woman who vanished last month at the Dead Horse Trailhead, Svetlana Ustimenko's rental vehicle was spotted in Grand Junction on July 31st. The car remained there past its scheduled return date of August 10th, leading crews to start searching for Svetlana, who's 55. Sadly, the family has shared that Svetlana was diagnosed with a terminal illness and she was struggling as she tried to cope. She was attracted to the Colorado mountains. Searches were conducted August 12th, 13th, 18th, and 20th, 20th with no sign of Svetlana leading investigators to determine she was not in the primary search area. Grand County Police said they have not received any leads, leading them to suspend the search pending new information. The trailhead Svetlana's car was found on is commonly used by hikers and bikers, and anyone with information about her whereabouts can call the Grand County Sheriff's Office at 970-725-3310. According to the Denver Gazette, police do not believe Svetlana's disappearance is connected to the disappearance of Melissa Whitsit, 34, who vanished from Grand County on August 13th. Whitsit failed to show up for work, and detectives learned that an unknown male used her phone to contact multiple people before it was cut off. Whitsit's debit card has not been used since she went missing. Hmm. So they don't think they're related at all. Okay. Whew. All right, so. Missing Instagram influencer's body found near a burned out car in a wooded area. A beauty coach. From Georgia. Georgia woman was found dead on Wednesday shortly after her car was found burning. The Austell firefighters responded to a brush fire and discovered beauty couches, burned out car. After towing the vehicle, police learned it belonged to Couch 22, who has been missing since Tuesday. Officers eventually went to the fire site and found Couch's body near a wooded area. Police say that foul play is suspected in this case. Couch was reportedly a social media influencer with nearly 150,000 followers on Instagram. Anyone with information regarding her death should call the Cobb County Police at 770-499-4111. This guy. Virginia man was arrested and charged with his mother's murder on Wednesday. Susan Ackerman Tabor, 67, was found stabbed to death inside the home she shared with her son shortly after 3 p.m. Andrew Russell Tabor showed up at the Stewart Elementary School just prior to the discovery of the body and was confronted by the school resource officer on duty at the time. Information obtained by the officer led deputies to the home about 600 feet away and the body, according to Sheriff Dan Smith. Smith said Tabor was not armed when he arrived at the school and was stopped by the school resource officer outside the building. 
DeBoer has been charged with first degree murder. An autopsy is being conducted. No further information was available. And there was that biker bar thing, mass shooting there. Retired police sergeant opened fire at a legendary California biker bar on their regular spaghetti night Wednesday, killing at least three people and leaving six others hospitalized. The Orange County Sheriff's Department said 911 calls came in at around 7.04 p.m. and they were on the scene at Cook's Corners two minutes later. By 7.08, deputies had engaged the gunman and killed him. Witnesses say the gunfire started in the bar's picnic area as the last hour of the special night began. Victims say they heard a few shots and then a brief pause before a heavy volley of gunfire. We heard gunshots randomly going off, said someone who lives near the Trabuco Canyon bar. After a few minutes, we heard it kind of increasing. Another witness said that the suspect left the bar and headed out to his truck to reload when deputies found him. He came in and he went back to reload and bring more guns and the cops found him, one woman said. I'm glad I didn't die. He shot four or six at me and missed. Another man said he just arrived as the, sh as the shooting started. I called 911 and they told me they already had deputies on the way. As soon as the deputies rolled up, he started unloading on them as well. They returned fire. I ducked for cover. No deputies were injured, police said. Six people were hospitalized, with at least five being treated for gunshot wounds. Two were in critical condition, with four in stable condition at the Providence Mission Hospital. Law enforcement swarmed into the area and closed off access. The FBI is assisting in the investigation. The Sheriff's Department said it would brief reporters Thursday afternoon and would not release information before that time. But they said now, from what I heard, that this guy was getting a divorce or something, and very certain that's what I saw. That he was getting a divorce. Yeah. Unhappy with divorce. That's he also shot five other people, including his estranged wife, before a deputy is shot and killed him. So he's a retired sergeant, angry about a divorce, and open fired at the legendary California biker bar. Killing three people and wounding five others, including his estranged wife. John Patrick Snowling, 59, retired from the Ventura Police Department in February of 2014. After a 32-year career in law enforcement that included serving as police union president, he separated from his wife, Marie, in 2020. After 22 years of marriage, she filed for divorce in March, and by some accounts, Snowling was not handling it well. Marie Snowling's father said his daughter was recovering from being shot in the jaw and that Snowling was a crazy husband who couldn't deal with a divorce.
Police say they believe they found the remains of missing North Carolina woman Alicia Watts, who was reported missing by family members last month. Following the discovery of the remains, Montgomery County Sheriff's Office announced the arrest of Alicia Watts' boyfriend, James Dunmore, on Thursday. Our heartfelt condolences go out to Alicia Watts' family, said Sheriff Pete Heron. During a news conference on Thursday, this is not the outcome that we had been hoping for, but by finding Alicia today, it can bring some closure. I hope and I pray bring some closure to family and to friends moving forward. Police were spotted searching along Cemetery Road, two hours east of Charlotte. Although police have not disclosed where they found the remains. Watts was last seen at Dunmore's home in Charlotte on Pamela Lorraine Drive. Her family reported her missing on July 16th. Two days later, police found Alicia's Mercedes SUV in the parking lot of the Anson County Department of Motor Vehicles office in Polkton, around 45 miles from Charlotte. The cellular data records that were obtained showed that Alicia's phone her boyfriend's phone and the vehicle all returned to the home at 1633 Pamela Lorraine Drive at around 3 p.m. on July 16th. All three remain at that location until 6 a.m. on 718. The Anson County Sheriff's Office said North Carolina State Troopers saw the vehicle with a man later identified as Dunmore inside. He told the deputies he was taking a nap, but when troopers returned to the lot three hours later, he was unresponsive. After his release, Dunmore remained elusive until the arrest. At the Montgomery County Jail at about 4.30 p.m. Thursday, he didn't reply when reporters questioned him about Watts. Police previously said they found shell casings from a 9mm gun outside of Dunmore's home, and they're now looking for any evidence of murder, any materials that may have been used to clean or cover up evidence of a homicide or assault. Dunmore remains behind bars without bail. All right. Um, trying to think now. So that is probably all the true crime I can handle right now. It's one thirty. It's early. Uh, let's see. I will take a poll. It's looking like yes. It's looking like yes. I better start a live and then I'll redirect us.
Thursday night, red night. All right, let me redirect you and we'll see you over there.